once you've built your life around the heteropatriarchy and now you're fulfilling all these roles that society says must be filled by women, then you're a woman. Yeah. It's, I call it's bullshit. Crazy. Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. My name is Brie Walker, Brie Logan on all platforms. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts and you are not subscribed, what you doing, baby? Hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening on Spotify, give us a follow. We have a great guest on today. Uh, she's a TikToker, a world traveler, minus COVID, and studying midwifery and women's studies. You can find her at kt.thedike on TikTok. Uh, please welcome Katie Estelle. Hi, Bree. Thank you so much for having me here. You're welcome. So I saw a video of you raiding lamps in your parents' beach house. Are, do you love lamps? Like, <laughs> it's so funny. You, I, It had me cracking up. Just the random fucking weird-ass lamps in this Connecticut house. I really, I wish I could explain that for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was just the quarantine boredom absolutely getting the worst of me. We acquired this cottage a couple of years ago. My parents purchased it and renovated it. And my bedroom, for some reason, came with an array of lamps. And they're all very different. And I don't like most of them. So uh, we're in the process of getting those bad boys out of here and finding them a new home. But of course, I had to make that lamp TikTok first. <laughs> That's hilarious. I thought it was I thought it was super funny. And I don't know when your boredom hits like creativity goes up, I think. And that's why I think like people that don't have a lot of shit going on. Well, especially with COVID, but even in general, like people who aren't like living in this city or living in the country, who like never have shit going on. I feel like that's where you get all of these sparks of these creators popping up and blowing off because they have nothing to do. So the creativity increases and then you just make weird shit shit but like everybody is weird so like everyone loves that weird shit absolutely oh my gosh yeah quarantine has been a pretty interesting creative outlet for me especially in terms of tiktok i would never have expected myself to have gained that kind of following or even be posting the kind of content i am probably if it weren't for just the opportunity to be trapped in my house all day <laughs> yeah seriously and like it was so funny like cuz i was on TikTok when quarantine hit too. Uh, millennial, what's up? I wasn't on it before that, and I kind of thought it was stupid. Like, <laughs> thought it was the dumbest thing ever. I had met someone like out, and they showed me like their TikTok, and I was, I in my head, I wasn't like mean in person, but I was like, I don't know why you're showing me this. Like, you're showing me this for clout, because like this is stupid. <laughs> and here I am, like fucking <laughs> doing the same oh my thing. Gosh. Hopefully, here to stay. My roommate this past spring, right before we had to leave campus, she and my other roommates would be doing the dances in our living room. And I was like, you guys, this is the stupidest thing. Like, this is for high schoolers and middle schoolers. Like, <laughs> what are you doing on this app? And then my one roommate who's by just pulled me aside and was like, you know, there's this whole community of lesbians on the app. And I didn't believe her at first. And then she started showing me videos. And I'm like, these are really cringy. <laughs> Yeah, the thirst trap. She this showed you not, all the thirst traps. <laughs> yeah, she probably th showed you the thirst traps. And that's honestly what I saw too. And I thought it was really cringy. I didn't see the comedy. And obviously, like, I don't know, the cringy stuff is there for probably maybe the younger demographic. But now there's an <laughs> older demographic, like your older Gen Zs, your millennials, even your Xers are on it now. And it's more vine e like before, right. but just definitely more sound and things like that, which is awesome. Um, I hope that they don't get it taken down because of the Chinese government and then not wanting to have, or the US not wanting to have our data, which is just a fucking hilarious thing, considering. Well, so so I, I think that's so interesting because that seems to be the story that at, at least the conservative media is telling. What I think is more interesting is the way that social media sites like TikTok, but before then Twitter and Facebook, the way that those platforms have been used in presidential campaigns. Cool. And I'm not sure if you know, but President Trump, when he was running in 2016, paid a third party company to collect people's data from Facebook 
And then he ran 10,000 different ads targeted towards people on Facebook for their specific likes, the things that they had posted. It was advertisements tailored to people who were essentially undecided in the election. And that majorly contributed to his win. So here we have this brand new app that has mostly liberal content and it has a huge queer community and it poses a major threat to the social media campaign, the social media aspect of conservative campaigns. So I'm not entirely surprised that the current administration is is trying to get rid of that. And it's just, we got to stay vigilant. And TikTok is certainly a good outlet for campaigning as far as Black Lives Matters go. Mm-hmm. And certainly with the queer community, it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with that. But we just got to stay on our toes there. Yeah, I think that TikTok was never on their radar until they saw what happened after George Floyd and how TikTok blew up and basically became the Twitter. Like, not that I'm a big Twitter person, but Twitter's first person news. But TikTok is now like first person news, but in video form. So it's even more shareable and viral because it has the sound. It has the not only just picture quality, but it has video. It's so much more viral. So if people are making content just as fast, because it's a 15 second video, just as fast as a tweet, TikTok is going to go faster and become first person news better than anything that you can text, anything that you can tweet. And that's where I've gotten a lot of my stuff, like a lot of the shit that I know, because I obviously my For You page is like, gay stuff. And then it's like political stuff. It's Black Lives Matter stuff. It's all of that. And I mean, it does suck that like, if you don't subscribe and and are in those type of for you and liking those things, you don't see that. But like, yeah, I get most of my stuff from there. And so I feel like that's, I think when it got on their radar is like, oh my God, like this is happening. Like Gen Z is single handedly taking down the Yeah, bullying the president on Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. So exactly what he did with Facebook is what's another liberal candidate could do on TikTok because they are rolling out ads. So if any liberal candidate is fucking smart, they would start doing it there. And they would obviously, I've seen stuff, Joe Biden posting um, sponsored ads on Instagram and things like that, which is good. But like, you need to get on TikTok. Absolutely. That's where the money's at. I'm excited to see how they start advertising and doing that because that's for creators. That's when we can start making money on the videos. Similarly to YouTube. Now, there is one of those things where like, you don't want them to have too much power, but you have to compromise with ads and and businesses and things like that for everybody to be happy. And I'm interested to see how it happens because with Vine, they weren't able to monetize. And that's why they, I don't know if you knew that, but that's why they went down. Twitter acquired them. They couldn't monetize and their creators went elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that it's very plausible that that could happen with TikTok as well. And I've seen a lot of creators making YouTube accounts and encouraging their TikTok followers to subscribe to them on YouTube because that's an easier way to make money. Yeah. And it's also, you have to have plan. Like you never know when a social media site is going to go down or, you know, you never know what's going to happen, right? Because with what happened with Vine and you want to cross promote so that you don't have everything in one place. You see the big creators even making a second TikTok in case something happens to their first one. Right. You know, maybe it's like weird and fun, but like at least it's there in case you need it. And in definitely creating more long form content, like a po- I've, I've seen podcasts pop up, like Ashley Gavin does a podcast for having gay sex. And that's super awesome. There's another, there's a non-binary a person who is also a comedian um, in Chicago that I just learned about yesterday. I forget what it's called, but they're starting a podcast. People are just starting to do shit because it's just a good, it's a good thing to do. And people want to talk more and people want to hear more. You know, like I was worried that people weren't going to want to hear an hour long podcast after listening to 15 second videos, but people do. There are people that want to want to do that. Obviously, there are people that aren't, but like it's a toss up. It absolutely is. Yeah, but I think it's just super important that we 
as as a community queer people need a more substantial platform i mean i think tiktok's great in a lot of ways it's also subpar in a lot of ways and i think it's important for these creators to expand beyond um just tiktok and give people a way to see queer people in their everyday life on their podcasts and really expand our territory there yeah we we need to expand we need to colonize (laughs) Rainbows We're everywhere. Colonizing the media. <laughs> Within the same vein of, you know, TikTok and queer community, how did that help you? Because I know that you identify as non-binary. What was that experience like for you? Oh my gosh, it was crazy. I mean, TikTok has been great. The algorithm just knows. Mm-hmm. I think I would rather not understand it, but... <laughs> Um, I didn't start to see essentially non-binary content on my For You page until I had manifested it myself and, and claimed it for myself. But it's just been really wonderful receiving so much feedback. I had one video that really took off when I was just thinking about the intersection between this femme appearance and a non-binary energy. And I had so much feedback promising me that non-binary does not need to mean androgynous. Androgynous features or an androgynous presentation to be valid and non-binary. And, and the whole the whole point of a non-binary identity is to say, fuck the labels, just exist in a space that allows for more diverse expression within one person. So of course, if, if those are the principles of non-binary identity, it, it would be counterintuitive to introduce these barriers of, oh, if you want to identify this way, you must present this mm-hmm. way. So um, just engaging in that discourse, even on TikTok, was really helpful for me as I'm considering this as, you know, an, an identity and an aspect of myself that I want to, to show the world. Yeah. No, I completely understand. And I really love that video about being more feminine and presenting more feminine, but also aligning more with a non-binary identity. I was like, that's so interesting because yeah, it, you do see a lot of the more androgynous, more masculine presenting, you know, non-binary folks. And that's not always the case. And it's, it's good to have that representation. Was it harder for you to come to terms with it because you had more of a feminine presentation? Absolutely. Yeah. So actually a funny story and I'm I'm not sure if I can tell this, but I'm just going to. So the day that I first started questioning my gender identity was the first time that I had tried psychedelics. So here I am sitting in my backyard. It was like a beautiful day. I was, the birds were just like way too loud. I didn't really know what was going on, but I was just having like a pretty chill afternoon outside. And then I just heard this. It's not so much hearing a voice, but just like feeling this message of you really need to, you know, start exploring your gender identity. So I'm like, uh, like, okay. (laughs) And immediately opened podcasts and was searching for queer podcasts to listen to. And and I just, I remember thinking, and I need to hear people talk about this and I need to consider all of the possibilities that my gender can take because similar with our sexual identity and a heteronormative culture, we've been brainwashed since birth that you're born into this body. Cool. Here's your gender. Here's the people you're supposed to be attracted to. Here's the life you're yep. supposed to live. And I feel so much pride in myself for being able to bust down one of those walls and say, fuck it. I like women. I don't yeah. want to date men. I don't ever want to marry a man. But then I, I just felt this little internal feedback of, well, maybe there's other aspects of identity that we should be exploring as well. Yeah. Yeah. So after listening to these podcasts, there was one I found, forgive me, I can't remember their name, but I'll have to get that to you somehow. But this one person was non-binary. And as soon as I heard their voice come over on the podcast, they sounded just like me, you know? And I think this is so interesting, the way we perceive androgyny and and non-binary identities. To hear someone with a higher pitched voice 
using they, them pronouns and identifying as non-binary. Um, and then I came to learn that this same person is very feminine presenting and is a person of color and is, is at the intersection of all these identities and is really just saying, fuck it, this is me. And that was just crazy inspiring for me. So it was really daunting at first to think, will I be accepted to this community? Yeah. Is this something I'm allowed to be? because of who I am. Yeah. And the answer is a resounding yes. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so awesome. Um, I love the fact that like you were taking psychedelics and you had that where someone's like, maybe you should do this. And you're like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a sign. <laughs> That's the Seriously fucking best. Was. I had no idea what was going on. Hey, I think it's a higher self thing. Especially when you're on psychedelics. Absolutely. It's your higher self oh knocking gosh, on the door. Yeah. They're like, hey, bitch, have you thought about gender? <laughs> that's entirely right. And, and that's my major. You know, my second major is, is women and gender studies. I know about it. You know, I've read the research. I've read the literature. And I understand it as, you know, a valid identity. And the voice is like, you idiot. Like, you know all about this. Why haven't you considered it for yourself? That's so, it's so crazy. And I had another question because I did have uh, a non-binary person on, I think it was actually my first episode, and they had talked about like pet names and different things like that. And it was something that I hadn't even thought about, like how we have gendered pet names. And it, it completely blew me away. Is, is that something that you kind of thought of like, oh, I don't really like to be called this. I'm more like this because of kind of those gender norms. Right. That's such an interesting question. I'm not really in a space where I'm offended by anything right now. I've thought of my gender identity as less of a rejection of the gender and the pronouns and the label of, of womanhood that I've been assigned. I'm, I'm not rejecting that. I'm just expanding upon it. I've noticed within myself that like when a stranger you know, walks by, say, like me, my mom, and my partner, if we're all like out for a walk, and he goes, hey, ladies, or hey, girls, I'm kind of like, eh. <laughs> like, yeah. do you know? But when it when it comes to, you know, my relationship with my partner, no, I mean, there really, there really aren't any words off limit because of their gender connotation. And she is also, you know, since I started talking to her about my doubts essentially about my gender identity she was saying oh, oh geez like maybe I'm the same way you know yeah. so she doesn't quite yeah. know that she's you know 100% woman either yeah. and uh, it's just something that we've been like stumbling through together so I have yeah. like a playlist on our Spotify that we both tribute to called girl-ish summer <laughs> and that's kind of our vibe right now <laughs> that's the best you're like not hot girl but girl-ish for sure right right like that's close enough that's fine after I had spoken with Eli just about like their pet names and things like that it made me think about it too like are there things that I I like and don't like and you know what's so interesting is I definitely because I I do identify as a woman but like it's so interesting to me I don't like girl either like when someone's like hey girls but like I would never want to be identified as like a man or anything like that but like I would rather I don't and this is the thing I don't know if it's because of societal things about like boys being like adventurous and boys mm. and like I don't know it might just be better than than the term girl because I definitely like the term woman but I would rather be called boy than girl, but I would rather be called woman, obviously, than man. Like, that's just so, like, eh, no. But, like, I would rather, because I'm a tomboy. So it's like, I'd rather be called a tomboy and boyish than girlish. But right. I definitely am a woman, and I like being a woman and, and womanly and things like that. So it's really interesting. I'm like, what the fuck is that all about? Like, is that is that just because my thought of boys and, like, growing up with cousins that are boys and rough housing and all of those more masculine traits, I more embody. And so I would rather identify as being a boy than, than being a girl, but I, I feel a very womanly too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This is a field day for me, honestly, as a queer <laughs> studies major. Like I just want to analyze the shit out of this. I know. <laughs> My immediate reaction is 
internalized misogyny. Growing up, you always hear like, you run like a girl, you throw like a girl. Even just, it, it triggers the shit out of me. But when I walk past a group of young boys on the beach, as I do a lot, they're insulting each other, calling each other girls. And I hate yeah. that to my very core. When that is 50% of the children in the world identify as girls, like, oh my gosh, that should never be an insult. But I think we've internalized that so much. Having grown up through girlhood into womanhood that it's like oh my gosh like I'm out of that I I don't want to be a girl again you know it's over I'm a woman now yeah but there's also this strange phenomenon within our culture of calling grown-ass women girls which I hate also And, and, and I hate that too and I feel like I do it and I try not to like I really try not to but there's just some things that sound I, and it's weird, but like linguistically, it sometimes it just sounds better to say girl than woman. So then right. I'm choosing that over my thoughts about using girl. Right. And so often I try to say women instead of girls if I'm talking about like a group of my friends. And I always get this side eye from older women being like, you're 21. Like, are, like you're calling you, you and your friends women instead of girls. But I, I just think there's something kind of creepy and maybe even predatory about calling grown adult women girls. Yeah. Just because they're older women, what constitutes you now being called woman? Like, what is their status or what is, like, their expectations of, like, do you have to be married? Do you have to have kids? Do you have to have grandkids? Do you have to have a mortgage, you know, to be a responsible adult? And then that equals you a woman? Like, what is that? Right. Once you've built your life around the heteropatriarchy and now you're fulfilling all these roles that society says must be filled by women, then you're a woman. Yeah. It's, I call it's bullshit. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely nuts. And I and I also hate the fact that when and and I've I've seen this and experienced this in my family, like when you're single versus when you're in a relationship, like if you're on vacation, you get your own room. Like, you know, if you have kids, now obviously if you have kids, like they're just more response and you know, more responsibility and I understand that. But like you kind of get a little more status. Like you're married and then you have a kid. You have another kid. And like oh, you got a house. And suddenly those things are more important than self-development, growth, going to therapy, finding yourself, traveling, like trying new things. It's not on par because I think it doesn't feed into capitalism and that's why. 110% could not agree more. That's exactly I've, it. I've seen that myself and it made me, it triggered me so much, especially like even before I came out, like there was a few years where I wasn't dating anybody because I didn't want to date men. And I obviously was trying to figure out my sexuality. I understand like when family members are like, so who are you dating? Cause they want to learn more about you. But like, you could ask me so many things. You could ask me, what am I doing? What am I learning in school when I was in college? Like what classes are your favorite? Like what, where do you want to travel to next? Cause I was such a big traveler and I studied abroad and all of that. Like what, what are you and your friends up to? Like, there's so many different questions you can ask then. Is there anybody that you're dating? Who are you talking to? Like, you know, and I know everyone wants that, those details, but for me, it was just super triggering because I'm like, motherfucker, like I have a whole life and it doesn't have anything to do with who I'm dating. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with men or who I'm dating. So like, I, I was so triggered by it. And then everyone stopped asking me because I was just, I get ear, I would get so irritated by it. Absolutely. And a lot of times, even the words that most people use when they're asking those questions are inherently triggering of, do you have a boyfriend or, you know, using these very gendered heteronormative phrases to ask us about those intimate parts of our lives. I mean, that is a, a toxic trait of most families that I think our generation just needs to absolutely yeah. nip in the bud. Yeah. And I think it was triggering because I was figuring out my sexuality. I mean, now if someone asked me that, I wouldn't be triggered by it in, in any reason. But like, it is something it's like, if you really wanted to know about me, and I, I do have family members who do ask those questions and friend and stuff like that. And it's super nice to be like, oh, thank you. Like, I'm actually like doing this self growth wise. I'm actually learning this new skill. Like I'm <laughs> like, you know, like those kind of things, like the things that are mattering to me right now society is is fueled around consumerism and capitalism and i know that like you are like a radical socialist and things like that so you definitely definitely get that Absolutely. but they value the 
those things. And not that buying a house is, is inherently bad. It, it grows wealth over time. Like it's not like it's a terrible investment or anything like that. <clears throat> But just to put so much status on and something like that, I just don't value those things as much as other people do. Like, I want to know what you're doing with your daddy issues. I want to know, like, how are you, like, making yourself a better person and making yourself a better person for people around you and, like, cultivating those relationships? Like, I don't really give a fuck if you, like, buy a house. And, like, I'm financially stable. Like, I'm excited about that stuff, but... I definitely don't judge people based on that. Right. It's it's just, I think it's absolutely senseless to be judging people based on, you know, attaining a certain degree of success within the heteropatriarchal capitalist confines. Success is so much bigger than what we're raised to think it is. I mean, I remember before I left for college and even, you know, some of the time that I've been in college of measuring my success and predicting my success based on, you know, what's the income I want to have and where do I see myself living permanently? Do I see myself partnered permanently? As humans, as people, we are just way too dynamic to be qualifying our success that way. Exactly. I think it's kind of a lower vibration, a lower self kind of deal. People aren't in touch with those kind of higher order things because we've been conditioned not to. Seen as hippie and alternative, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, I think that, and I'm not going to be saying absolutes, but I think that a lot of those common religions feed into that whereas other religions don't or some other spiritualities and different things don't really feed into that because they've never been told that they were okay in the first place so they're just kind of like fuck it i think that's why once like somebody comes out and you're already kind of other like everything else just falls in you're like i might as well be a fucking vegan in the middle of Iowa. Like I might as well, you know, be a witch. I might as well live in a cabin and make my own beet juice. Like who gives a fuck now? Like that's right. Once you break one barrier down, all the rest are like, who's next? (laughs) Yeah. Who's next? (laughs) But yeah, I know that you live in Connecticut. So like, what has that been like? Cause like you definitely posted things about being like in an affluent beach community living in the East Coast. What has that been like for you personally with your, with your views? (laughs) Right. Well, Connecticut is a very blue state, but ironically, the towns that I've grown up with are not. (laughs) My mom remarried after a divorce when I was very young. So when I was seven, we moved in with her, um, her husband, who she's still with now, it's like right in the middle of Connecticut, like dead center. And it is super fucking conservative, just like really Italian, Catholic, old school. It just does not vibe with the general liberal energy of Connecticut. And yeah, that restricted my identity and expression so much growing up. I remember in high school, I just looked like, I think it's so funny now, but I just looked like every other heterosexual white blonde girl. Like seriously, (laughs) disgusting. The creativity was absolutely not there. (laughs) I was not expressing myself authentically. And really, like I, everyone just looked the same. There wasn't a lot of racial or ethnic diversity in this town. Like everyone presented the same same way, very gender binary. And I remember like, I mean, part of this is because I was attracted to them, but it was also like, (laughs) do I want to be you? Or like, do I want you? But I remember just like, like taking notes almost on like the girls I'd see in the hallway. I'm like, what is she doing with her hair? What is she wearing? Like, what is she doing? How do I replicate that within myself? So it wasn't until like, I, I got out of that bubble and went away to college and really like expanded my horizons. And then I realized how restrictive that environment had been for me. I completely understand. I feel like part of that was probably because you liked them, but also it's probably because you were just trying to fit in. And that's why you felt like you were probably boring and looked like everybody else because you were trying to just fit in and look like everybody else. That's what I did too. Like I remember, oh, I remember um, thinking I had this. So like we had like, 
littles and bigs and like basketball. And I remember my big who I absolutely think is just like the coolest person now. But then like she didn't dress like everybody else. She dressed alternative. And I remember, I don't know why being irritated that I didn't have a big that was uh cool and went with the crowd and was like popular and now looking back i'm like she was a fucking og like that's why i was so triggered by it is because i was still in that space because i was like in i don't know seventh or eighth grade still trying to conform and i wanted boys to think i was cute little teen boys i wanted other women or other girls at the time because i don't know 13 years old girl i guess (laughs) 13 to think i was cool and wanted to be my friend and invite me to parties and shit like that so like i completely get that it was just a nightmare looking back on everything and i remember the small queer community that did exist in my high school everyone had like purple hair or like the rainbow suspenders like very like very alternative really my options were assimilate look like everyone else or like you're going to be ostracized yeah maybe you need to radically change your appearance you know like it was just it was scary being confronted with that binary yeah when i was kind of in my coming out journey i was kind of wrestling with those things too because i was like I didn't want to dress super feminine anymore. And I was, I wanted to dress more tomboy, which is hilarious because that's how I was growing up. Like right. before, you know, when you get to the, where you're like wearing dresses and you care about people's appearance. Like, I feel like it's weird because like girls are okay to be tomboys. And then once they hit a certain age, it's like suddenly not okay. And that's kind of in that 12 to 14 range where it's like not okay to be a tomboy anymore and you have to be girly. And I started being girly in like fifth grade. And I don't remember not like, I don't remember being like, oh, I hate this. So I still sporty and I was still a tomboy, but like, I don't know. I feel like once I came out, I reverted back to how I was when I was like three, four, five, six, seven, you know? That's so interesting. Yeah. It's super, it's super cool, I think. Oh my gosh. So I had like a little dyke haircut when I was like 11. (laughs) I shit you not. It was right after Harry Potter ended. I remember this vividly. Emma Watson cut off all of her hair right after the last movie because she was like, fuck this. I'm not Hermione Granger anymore. Uh Uh-huh. And I was so intensely attracted to Emma Watson. And I saw her cut all of her hair off. And I was like, oh my God, I need to do that too. (laughs) So I showed a picture of her to my mom's hairdresser after like doing everything but make a PowerPoint for my mom about why I needed to cut my hair that short. And I showed her hairdresser the picture and she was like, all right, like, cool you can do that it was atrocious it looked so bad it was it was just nasty but it took me you know the rest of middle school to grow my hair out and so that was just like prime bullying material there but now looking at those pictures of me when I was 11 when I still had that fuck it I'm just gonna present however I want to yeah oh she was onto the right thing like she was really trying to do her best and uh Yeah, it didn't work out that time. I love this quote. I'm going to paraphrase it. If you've seen, um, I forget what the the full name is. I think it's still on Netflix. It's a documentary and it was like Feminist, What Are They Thinking? I think that's the title. Oh, I watched that so many times. And it has Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin and a bunch of other queer artists and poets and like so many different things. And Jane Fonda talks about how, you know, you're fiery as as a girl and and you're self-assured, and she vividly talked about how she thought of herself when she was young, and then at some point when puberty hits, it just like shatters all of that, and now you have to conform and do these things because of a period, because now, and maybe that's when she was younger, so people got married younger, so then you have to like, okay, now you have to take care of a house, now you gotta do this, like all of these things, and she talks about that woman, that girlhood being suppressed, and that female empowering energy being suppressed because of the patriarchy and having to find that continually throughout her adulthood was something that she had to do. And, and she reclaimed that through activism, which is what everyone right. you know, should know her by is her activism. Right. I, oh my goodness, that quote that you're talking about, that hits so close to home. I watched that documentary for the first time when I was abroad in South Africa. So I'm already having this like journey to the self moment. Yeah. And to hear Jane Fonda, who I love so dearly, 
just putting words to the way I felt my whole life, it was so powerful for me. And I think a lot of people who were designated female at birth have gone through this, this journey of, of having a few hard years where you feel really suppressed yeah. because you're just, you know, as you reach puberty and you're, you're on your road to becoming a woman, that's when all of the weight of our culture starts pushing you down now because you were a kid and now you're becoming a woman and this is what women do in our culture. And uh, I remember when I was in high school, I wanted to be a boy so badly. I, at, at that time, my knowledge and understanding of gender was very limited and it would make me like sad because yeah. I would, I wanted to be funny and I was hearing all these messages that girls aren't funny. Like boys are funny. Sure. But girls no. And I, and I wanted so desperately to like make people laugh and be funny. And I remember just being like, ah, like these are the cards I was dealt. I'm a girl. I, I can't be funny. Yeah. Of course I wanted to date girls and I, I felt that I couldn't because I was a girl and not a boy. And, you know, I, I wanted to play hockey like my brother. And, and there were all of these paths that I could take in life that I, at that time, just kind of sat down and threw myself a pity party. Yeah. And thought, this is totally unattainable for me because of, you know, my gender. And now looking back on that, it's like, no, you can be funny. You can yes. be girls. You can play hockey. You can do whatever the fuck you want mm -hmm. because none of those things are inherently gendered. Yes, exactly. And it's so hard to break down that binary. I remember one of my very first I have two very vivid memories of realizing that girls are different from boys and girls can't do some things that boys can do. And there are two. One of them was I was in preschool and we, I, I went to a Christian preschool because I grew up Methodist and I love that preschool. It was awesome. But uh, I remember we did like the nativity scene. And so you had a bunch of angels and then you had, I, I don't know all of the names, but the mom and the dad or whatever. And then you had Jesus and then you had a little drummer boy. I'm sorry, the mom and the dad. What the fuck? What's in the nativity scene? It, there's the, it's not. There's... Mary and Joseph? Is yeah. that mom and dad? <laughs> yeah. Can you tell I'm not religious anymore? <laughs> okay, so you had Mary and Joseph and you had the baby. <laughs> and so you had, you know, the t two kids, a boy and a girl playing Mary and Joseph and everyone else was angels. But then there was a little drummer boy. And my God, I wanted to be the drummer boy so fucking bad. I, I loved playing music. I ended up drumming later on in life and like playing in jazz band. I was a girl drummer, whatever. And I remember I was so young and I remember being like, I can be a drummer boy. Like it never occurred to me that I couldn't be the drummer boy. And I told my teacher, like, I want to be the drummer boy. I want to be the drummer boy. I told the fucking principal, like I was so hyped about it. Like I am showing that I need to be the drummer boy. Like I would show my skills and I would like do stuff on the table and everything. And my teacher finally, I think for being irritated, just like looked at me and was like, can't be a drummer boy. You're not a boy. You're a girl. And I just looked at her like, what the fuck? Like, why, why can't I do this? Like, I'm proven to you. Like, I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm better than anyone else. Like, they probably just chose. And they just chose some fucking dude who was just like, <laughs> I was so mad. And I didn't understand why. And I was pissed that I was just an angel among all the other angels. But that's just like, I don't know, I'm a performer. So I was like, I need to be better than that. But I was so mad and I was so confused and I didn't understand why I couldn't be the drummer boy. Because honestly, like, I didn't really grow up with a lot of that at the beginning. Like, I was okay to be a tomboy and I would always hang out with, you know, my cousins who are boys. And I never really got a lot of that pressure. And I was always good in sports and, like, I was always, like, my you know, my paternal figures, my father figures and my, you know, my dad and my other, you know, uncles and stuff, like they always promoted that. So like up until that point, I had not had anybody say I couldn't do something because of my gender. So right. I was pissed, so pissed. And I remember being mad and talking to my mom about it. And like, I don't remember my mom really saying anything. Like, I don't remember her being like, that's just the way it is, like anything like that. I don't really remember her doing much about it. I don't know if she was just humoring me or what. But like that was my first thing and I think I was like three or four when I realized that like I couldn't be a drummer boy, apparently. And these things stick with us. Like they really do. These are the formative 
events of our childhood that have shaped our identity. And if one day in the future I decide to have children, I, I don't want them to have these same experiences. I'm picturing this like utopia where everyone is non-binary at birth until they discover their gender. And then, yeah. and maybe you choose to stay non-binary and maybe you choose to go one way or the other. I really think the way that our culture raises young people is is incredibly restrictive. And then it only enables us to create more barriers within those identities. I mean, just think about any of the millions of identities within even just the lesbian community. It's crazy. And, and this is all stuff that we've made up ourselves. I mean, there there is a history within the queer community of people wanting to feel a sense of belonging and, and wanting to have a niche community to identify with. And then they go ahead and make all of these labels up. And it's like the declaration, the coming out of, I am not only a lesbian, but I am a this type of lesbian. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's incredibly restrictive, but our queer ancestors thought of it as a, a liberation. When I read for the first time in the history that coming out was not something the heteropatriarchy imposes on queer people, but rather it's a decision that our queer ancestors made of like anyone who's queer needs to declare their identity in an act of liberation. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah. I am so resented coming out. And especially on the gender scale, I do consider myself more femme. I mean, I don't even know how I feel about the word lesbian right now, but like yeah, from a lesbian perspective, like I've never been a femme lesbian. I'm always yeah. somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And I just so resented the idea of coming out because it's like, why, why should I have to disclose my sexuality? Why is that anyone's business at all? And just because I look like I could pass as straight, you know, that I'm expected to come out. Learning that, that it was supposed to be a form of liberation is like so frustrating for me. I want to just call up, <laughs> you know, all of the lesbians and gays of the 70s yeah. and 80s and be like, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I guess for them, it was more, yeah, like a liberation, like I'm staking my claim, like I'm showing who I am when it's funny, because like some people feel like, like you said, such a, it's such a burden, like, wouldn't it be great to just have a clean slate? And just right. it's not you don't even need to come out because it just is. And like, I kind of think of it in an analogy of like, you have a plant that's like a caged plant, and it's trying to grow and it has to weave in and out and fucking and some of the some of the leaves get stuck under and they don't get to grow and there's not you know and you have a plant that's fully able to just do whatever they want because there's just there's nothing restricting them and it's a clean slate and they don't have to sift through these preordained gender roles and all of this other bullshit to get to who they are now I do feel like I I really feel like I've earned it so maybe you know, those, those people that like our kids will be entitled because, <laughs> because they wouldn't Sorry. have to go through all the pain of <laughs> having to do it. And so they, I don't know, like, what would that look like? Like you do see some young Gen Z's who seem like it's so easy. And I feel like a lot of millennials feel that way. They're like these fucking Gen Z's just like walk <laughs> on in and they're like, I'm bi, I'm pan, I'm non-binary. And, and I had to work for it. And that there's right. a lot of shit going on. <laughs> So like it's blood, funny. sweat, and tears. Yeah, like if I have kids and and I'll be so happy, obviously, that they can do what they want. But I think if they say anything about oh, it's so hard to be gay, I'm gonna be like motherfucker. I'm going. <laughs> I'm not gonna beat your ass because I'm nonviolent, but I'll make you write a letter or something. It's the new. I had to walk four miles to school uphill in the rain both ways. Yeah. <laughs> now as queer parents, we're going to be like, I had to fight all these old people for trying to put me in boxes. And Yeah, you guys don't know who Karens are, but Karens <laughs> were running wild in my day and they sucked. <sighs> oh gosh, I really hope my kids will never have to meet a Karen. And I hope, this is another thing that I liked about your videos, I hope that they don't have to fucking worry about body hair. Because oh my gosh. I saw, uh, I love this because I was starting to post stuff because like I don't shave my armpits either. And I started doing that 
I did it and then I shaved after a breakup and then I was like, you know what, fuck it. I know it's the summer, but whatever, I'm getting over this. It was so funny because my mom was like, she like looked at me, she goes, are you doing this on purpose? And I was like, yeah, I actually am. Isn't that interesting? And my mom had su- has such a, not a problem with it, but like it's such a, gave such a reaction out of her. I think mm-hmm. this is because how she was raised. It's just like one of those things. I remember, because I have like bushy eyebrows and I remember, you know, like if I didn't tweeze them, I would definitely have like a unibrow. And I remember getting made fun of by boys when I was like 11. And so I started literally getting my eyebrows waxed at 11 because of that. And mm-hmm. yeah, and my mom, she didn't think anything of it. Cause like there's a certain point when you, we, that was like at that time where like people were starting to hit puberty. So I like mm-hmm. didn't shave my legs and do any of that. And my mom didn't tell me that I needed to, but it was just because I got made fun of that. My mom was like, did you feel better getting a wax? And I was like, yeah, you know, and I've been waxing ever since because of those fucking dipshit. Right. Dip, which is funny. One of those guys is like the, the coolest guy now. He's like super hippie. He's like actually really awesome. But it was just like fifth grade boys, you know? Right, right. But I love that, those videos you posted about your armpits, because I'm like, I'm fucking doing it too. (laughs) I started growing them out when I was abroad in South Africa this past fall. Really just like being in a country where I didn't know anyone. I wasn't really there with like a group of people from school. They were two other women who went to my same school, but we didn't like plan on going together. So I was in this space where I didn't know anyone. I was like, fuck it. Like, what do I have to lose here? So, and and I just hate shaving as a practice in general. There are parts of my body that I have not shaved since I was probably like 15. Awesome. And I just have no reason to do it except our culture. Yeah. So I just sent it and, and grew out my armpits. And then in quarantine, I started growing out my legs as well, which has been super fun. But, and like my eyebrows too, like I just stopped plucking my eyebrows and I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? Like, let me just see how they grow in. So that's like my biggest piece of advice to anyone is just let it grow and see what it looks like. And how you feel about it. Right. Like Ew. myself included, I've been shaving some of these parts of my body since I was, I don't even know, 13, yeah. 12. Like I, I don't even know what the hair would look like un- until you let it come back. Like just recently I stopped shaving above the knee and they are just the sweetest little wispy blonde hairs. Me and I'm too. like, why would I, don't why shave would I them. Have ever shaved that? Yeah. <laughs> like they're so cute. So just like let it all grow in. You can always shave it off after. Yeah. But just I see agree. what it looks like because you might like it. You might enjoy it. Me too. I did. I started doing that and like it's weird because my thoughts changed about it because that's above the knee too. Like I just don't shave. Like I just, because they're so, they just like, yeah, they're so light. It doesn't even matter. And it takes forever anyways because they're longer and there's more surface area. But like, I'm always kind of thinking like, oh, mm-hmm. like around my ankles, the darkest. And like some days that's I'm great. like, they don't matter. And then other times I'm like, oh, like I would kind of like it to look sleek. And I talked to like my mom and my uh, sister about it because it's more for them. They don't like the way that it feels and they want it to be slicker. And obviously they like the mm-hmm. appearance of it. Cause it's funny. Cause they look at me like I'm like foreign. Like they look at me like, you know, when I don't shave and they're just like, what the fuck? Like they just kind of like look at me like I'm an alien, but also they just enjoy the feeling. And I don't care. Like it doesn't really bother me to have hair hit my leggings. If I wear like, I don't even wear leggings right. anymore, but when I did, it just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't bother me anymore. Cause like, I don't think I've ever seen, I had a friend that was a girl been with any girl that was like, your leg like, hair sucks or like your armpits suck. You know, I've never had any complaints. Yeah. And even if I did, I don't think that would be somebody that I would date. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, oh my gosh. I, when I was still dating, I had this trick. <laughs> I would just put lotion on my legs oh my God. before sex. And then my boyfriend would be like, oh, babe, did you just shave your legs? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they can't tell. They literally can't tell. <laughs> Pro tip, if you're, if you're, you know, if you like men and they're still dating men and you don't want to fucking subscribe to the patriarchy, do that. Lotion up your legs. They'll feel so soft. The hair is like not even there. Oh, my gosh. 
But the funniest, I, I think it's absolutely hilarious. You were saying people will look at you like you're an alien because yeah. you let your body hair grow. I've gotten so many questions since I started letting my armpits grow about like, oh, does it does it get smelly? Like, does the sweat just kind of like cling there? Like, what happens? Do you ask those questions to men? No. That's literally what I told my mom. I was like, no, no one has ever shamed men for being unhygienic because they don't shave their armpits. Like it's the, the hair's supposed to be there. It grows there naturally. I don't have to do anything to make it grow. This is what my body wants to do. And I don't fucking smell. So there you yeah. go. And well, it's also like, because it's overtly masculine to have ma- that masculine spunk it's more expected for men to be smelly and less hygienic than women. So I think that it's just like, ooh, that's his man smell. Like, that's his spunk. Like, like whatever, whatever, <laughs> you know? And for women, it's not like that. And I also find it interesting with armpits because, like, I've gotten people, like, are triggered. Like, when I show my armpits and I made some specifically for that. And I've had people comment Dollar Shave Club. I've had people comment, like, is someone going to tell her? And usually the comments, the shitty comments I get are always from men. But the ones I get for my armpits are half and half. Like the oh, women so are triggered because of, they ha- also have misogyny. It's not just men hating women. Like there are women who still have that internalized misogyny too. Like, right. like do you not think that I fucking see it every day and that I literally <laughs> am doing a video where I'm showing it and I'm like, oh, I had no idea. I've been growing it out for three months. And I also, this is, I'm, I just love this rant because I did a little a video on this, but like people have not been shaving. Women have not been shaving since, I mean, I think it's been like a hundred years maybe that they have been shaving. I, I don't know the exact details. Maybe you do. But it was because with consumerism and capitalism, they knew that they were taking out a majority of people. And so they were cultivating this. If you want your man to like you, if you want all of this, you want to be attractive, like mm-hmm. shaving. And that's where most of the money now comes from is with women and not men. And then you ha- add the pink tax on it and all of these things. And they're right. profiting, not just in the beauty community about telling women that they're not enough. They need all of this shit. But I think it started with shaving. And then it kind of get in- got into all of the other beauty shit. And I don't want to subscribe to that either. Not that I am just like down with all forms of capitalism because I feel like there are goods and services that need to be brought to value and that bring people value. And that should be there. But I think that there's also all of this stupid, superficial bullshit of consumerism and it's taking the materialism out of things, you know? Right. It is the greatest marketing scam of all time to convince 50% of the population that they need to shave nearly all of their body hair. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. That is such a scam. It really is. I thought about doing lasers, or like like laser hair removal at one point because I was like, I don't even want to, I just was like, I don't want to take the time to shave every day and maybe I'll just get laser hair removal and not have to deal with it. And then, and then now I'm like, I like the body hair. Like I like it. I, I'm right. so glad I did not do that and it was too expensive for me to do it because mm-hmm. I would have regretted it. My, my leg hair is also darkest down near my ankles. So that's like the only part of, of my legs that I'm shaving now. And I literally just like get the little dark hairs gone and then pretty much everything else is just like light and blonde and I don't mind as much. There's definitely like a, like if you're not going to shave it every day, don't shave at all. Yeah, (laughs) Because I think the stubble is more annoying than like a long, soft hair. That was my fuck it moment of like, if I'm (laughs) not going to do this every, because I love the silky dolphin leg. I love that. Oh my God. Like that's the hottest thing. If I don't want to put that effort in every single yeah. day, I'm not going to do it at all. What's the yeah. point? <laughs> I love that tangent that we went on. All right. Hey, Katie, you want to answer some questions really fast? Absolutely. Hit me. Sweet. Cake or cookies? Cake. Texting or talking on the phone? Ah, oh, talking on the phone, please. Dog or cat? Dogs. Big spoon or little spoon? Totally depends on the moment, but if I had to pick for the rest of my life, big spoon. Favorite queer movie? Portrait. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Classic. Me too. Wonderful, well-made, gorgeous, incredible casting. Yes. Intimacy, chemistry. Yes. Yes. I feel the same way. Every queer person in real life has told me that they don't like it and they think it's boring and it takes too long. And I'm like, but it's what they don't say. That's what what they they don't say. say. And it's just so pretty. 
Oh. It is. Okay, cool. Uh, flannels or Hawaiian shirts? Flannels. Last song you listened to on repeat? This is actually kind of niche, but Floors by Abby the Nomad. Giving presents or getting presents? I'm a greedy bitch. Getting presents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, last one. First celeb you had a crush on? Emma Watson. Do we yeah. do, do need to ask? <laughs> I know. I know. Right when I asked it, I was like, she did say Emma Watson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, awesome. Katie, thank you so much for being on this podcast. If you want to check out more about Katie, you can find her on TikTok at katie.thedyke. And as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a little review. Helps us get discovered by more queer queer people just like you. That's it for this episode, my queers. Thank you for listening and subscribing. Um, Be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.